Hello, everybody. How's it going? How's your conference? Good? Excellent. I'm being completely honest. I'm not trying to suck up to you guys. The energy at this conference has been great. So I'm going to thank you guys as well. And of course, all the Kelby people. So, woo! All right. <laughs> okay, guys. So let me tell you a little bit about me. And then guess what? This class probably should be two hours. I'm from New York. I talk fast. Sorry. Um, I will try to help you out. What I'm going to do for this presentation, I will put these notes up on my blog, which you see right there. Um, so if you miss any of those initial notes, it'll be up there. Feel free to take as many photographs as you want. Um, I'm going to walk you through my lighting setup, my thought process, uh, things like that. And of course, um, you can always send me comments and questions in Google+. And in about two weeks, I'll get to you. No, I'll try really hard. Um, so let me first start with a little bit about me and my job. Um, how many people photograph models? OK, cool. Um, how many people photograph models and get paid for photographing models? See, that's, like, that's kind of the, the big question there. Um, for me, I have the coolest job in the world because I get to shoot really weird things and pretend like you know, it's, I'm really artistic and deep, but I just shoot whatever I want. Um, it is a great job. I photograph beautiful people in beautiful places, in beautiful clothing, in beautiful light, with beautiful hair and makeup. Um, sometimes it seems like my job maybe is a little too easy when you start off with those raw materials. Um, but what I'll be talking about today um, is you have a lot of different forums for creativity, right? So it could be the styling that's really creative. It might be the concept, the hair, makeup, and wardrobe. Maybe you go to a cool location that is going to be really unique and creative. But you also have the tool of creative lighting. Um, the problem with, and I'm saying this lightly, the problem is that most photographers, you take your classes and you learn about kind of traditional lighting setups, which are great. They can be great because they're going to be great for traditional portraits, which will help you make money, which we all like to do. Um, they're going to be great because they're go-to, they're foolproof, you're going to get great portraits every time. But what happens is you learn these rules and people s stick to them. Like they really just stick to those rules. And that's why if you're looking at portrait after portrait, it's all lit the same. You kind of just flip through it, right? Because it's, you know, if, if the people all, you know, they're beautiful people, it's the same light, you just kind of flip and it just, you don't remember it. It's not memorable. It's not striking, it doesn't have impact. So what I'll do today is I'm going to show you five creative studio lighting setups that have impact or that are completely different than what you'll see for normal portraits or normal fashion photography. Um, if, okay, how many people have looked through a fashion magazine? They're flipping through and you're like, holy crap, this is horrible. Right? I mean, I, I, I still do it. I'm flipping through and it's horrible. But sometimes, just people ask me this about uh, justification. Sometimes you flip through and you see the horrible light but you stopped and looked at the photograph because you're trying to figure out why it was lit so horribly. Um, I don't take that approach, but that's what I'm going to say with creative lighting. As you're flipping through, if you're seeing the same kind of lighting over and over again, it doesn't register in your mind. But when you see lighting that has impact, that has drama, you stop and it makes an impression on you. So we'll have five creative studio lighting setups today. I have a beautiful model with hair, makeup, and wardrobe. I'm going to touch on my lens choice. So we're going to talk about the camera, the lenses I choose, and why. I will also be talking about the angles that I shoot from. I'll be talking about the modifiers that I use. Um, I will be talking a lot about everything. Um, my theory as a presenter is I try to give you as much information as possible. Um, and then you know whatever sticks, I hope, changes the way that you approach your photography. Um, that's I was talking last night with several other presenters and teachers. And one of the things we were talking about is that's why we teach. If we give you one thing that changes the way you approach photography, it changes the way you shoot, as photographers, it actually changes your life. Um, so I'm hoping that you're able to take one or two things away that you feel, okay, my photography from here on out will be better because of this. Um, so afterwards, also feel free to come ask me questions. I'm happy to answer them. Uh, I'll do a little bit more about me and the type of work I do and why. Um, for me, I'm really focusing on high impact. So as my job, I'm a fashion photographer in New York City. 
I've been shooting for 11 years. Um, I'm young. I opened my portrait studio when I was in high school with my mom. Um, and so I've been shooting for 11 years. And I started off doing landscapes and flowers and nature photography and photojournalism. And then finally, I found fashion photography. And what I loved is there were no rules. If I wanted a girl with a giant wig with rain in the foreground and her to have really crazy makeup on, I could just because I wanted to. Um, so I moved after college, I moved to London, I pursued my fashion photography there, and then came back and I've been in New York City for three years now. And I shoot everything from avant-garde fashion to commercial ads to jewelry campaigns. Um, but what I'm always keeping in mind whenever I'm shooting is impact. Because anybody can shoot a beautiful woman in beautiful clothing in front of a beautiful background. But what can I do to make my images memorable? And sometimes that's the lighting. Other times it's the Photoshop effect. So maybe it's the, the effect that I do in post-processing that makes that image have incredible impact. Or maybe it's amazing hair, makeup, and wardrobe. For this shoot, we had to take a separate taxi just to put the dress in. Um, because that's impact, that's memorable. Um, so you have all these different things as, for, um, at your disposal for creativity. Here's the girl with the crazy wig, with the rain in the foreground and the fog, just because I wanted to, because it has impact. And that's the beauty of fashion photography. There are no rules. And so today, with my lighting setups, I'll be breaking rules several times. For example, I'm going to do a shot that has lens flare in the studio. I'm creating lens flare on purpose. You're not supposed to do that, except for it can look great. It can set the mood. It can be exactly what you need to have impact and stand out from all of the other images. It's very challenging as a fashion photographer uh, because my job is to be creative. So every single client that comes to me, they're saying, OK, Lindsay, we love your style. Please now do the most creative shoot you've ever done. Um, it's very overwhelming. Um, and so you need to take all the tools at your disposal to try to do that. Um, for people, how many people saw me do the live shoot um, over in the Westcott booth? So a couple things that I talked about um, for impact, a couple things that I do is put together hair, makeup, and wardrobe. So just to give you a little background, can I have, do we have both girls here? Can I bring you out real quick? And what is she, it, where's the other model? Okay, have cover come back up. Okay, um, say hi. Okay, so for when I'm doing shoots, Sometimes I'm like, okay, I need to have impact. I need to be different. I want to excite people. And so maybe that's going to be hair and makeup. So here it's going to be a bright red wig and white out skin. And that has impact. Um, this is clothing that you can get at vintage shops. Or maybe where I get clothing a lot of times is vintage shops, consignment shops, or um, have you guys heard of Etsy? Etsy.com? It's a website for people that make stuff and sell stuff. Um, so a lot of the clothing and props I have here today, I reached out to somebody on Etsy or a local designer or a vintage shop and said, listen, um, I'm a photographer. I have some really great ideas for shoots, and I'd love to feature your clothing, your hair and makeup or something in my work. So I try to frame it as it's an honor for them or it's something that's going to be able to help them if I shoot. So I'll say, oh, I, that dress that you have on your Etsy site, that's really beautiful. But I think it would look better on a model than a mannequin. Or I could do some really great shots for promotion. So the things that I have here today, none of the clothing, it's, it wasn't really expensive. It's not like I had to buy it or I had to have connections in New York City. Everything you see here today was either vintage shops, Etsy, um, a social network called DeviantArt, um, just reaching out to my social networks and saying, okay, who knows any cool designers that might lend me clothing? Or who can recommend me somebody for hair and makeup for my shoot? So I utilize social media regularly, whether it's Google+, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Facebook, to help put together my shoots and have it not cost a lot of money. Um, so that's a whole other discussion, but I just wanted to kind of run you through that, and you'll see uh, the next model as well, the cool clothing that she has. So for me, in order to be creative, sometimes it has to be creative with the lighting. In this instance, for example, it's two shots put together. So when you usually think of compositing, you think of sticking a model in one location on a different background. 
But here it's taking one picture of the, the jewelry and compositing it on a picture of the model for cool lighting. Or this is my signature lighting that I've done a ton of times. That's how we're going to shoot her today. So I'll show you how this lighting is done as well as the Photoshop. So if you want to do this, it's, it's easy. Red wig, red glasses, red lipstick. You'll see the setup. Not complicated. So again, sometimes it's creative lighting that helps me stand out. She here? Cool. OK, so again, this clothing, um, I found somebody on Etsy. And I asked if I could borrow it for a shoot. And in exchange, they would get photos to promote their work. So just think of these things. If you reach out to your social networks, reach out to people, and remember the value of photography. Your photography is worth something. So if you're telling them this will help you sell your products, this will help you promote your brand, um, you'll definitely be able to kind of pull together these shoots. So um, what is the perfectly lit image? There is no perfectly lit image, obviously. Um, for those two models, would you light both of those models the same way, looking at them standing side by side? No, obviously you, you wouldn't. You would light them completely differently. And so that's why there's no right lighting, and that's why so many people, you learn your traditional lighting setups, but then you get stuck on that. So you need to think outside the box, and you would do two totally different things for those two women. So which one's lit correctly? OK, trick question, obviously. Um, they're all lit correctly. So for you guys today, I'll show you some really fun techniques for good lighting. Really, you just make it work. If it looks good, if it fits, if it's really dramatic where everything falls to black um, and it, there's dramatic shadows on the face, but that's what you wanted it to be, it's right. For the other, um, for the kind of white dress, red hair, if you want it to be blowout white skin and bright red lips and it's completely flat lighting, that's fine as well. So that's what we're going to get to now. And I'm going to shoot tethered. How many people have shot tethered on stage in front of a ton of people? So if something goes wrong, just, just love me. OK, we're going to give this a try. Um, I am going to be tethering in Lightroom. And if you want to know how to do that, you come up here to File, Tether Capture, Start Tether Capture in Lightroom 3 and 4. And I'm just going to get this set up. Let's just pick one here. Can you grab my camera for me? Thank you. All right. So I'm just going to get to it, and I'm going to do lighting that breaks the rules. We're going to do flat lighting. You're not supposed to light things flat. Well, I'm going to light it flat, and it's going to look beautiful. I'm going to do lens flare. You're not supposed to have lens flare in your shoots. I'm going to add lens flare, and it's going to look beautiful. Oh, other side. That's cool. All right. Oh, do you have nails? <laughs> Thank you. All right. So let's talk a little bit about light modifiers and what I use here and some different uh, camera equipment that I use. All right. So let's start with lens choice. Um, for my lenses, I use pretty much five lenses for most things that I do. Um, I have them all here. I shoot often for beauty photography the 85 millimeter 1.4 lens. Um, a lot of times for beauty photography, particularly on location, because if I'm shooting constant light or natural light, and I can shoot at 2.8 or 1.4, it really helps me keep my images clean and high impact. That's what I'm looking for. So when it's clean and high impact, because I'm shooting at 1.4 or 2.0 or 2.8, um, it really, really helps me focus on the model, clean up the background, and get rid of really ugly things in New York City um, that I'm constantly having in my backgrounds. So that's going to be kind of my close-up lens. I also shoot my 51.4, so those are it's kind of more mid-length, something like that. Um, the go-to lens for most of my beauty photography is going to be the 70 to 200, um, 2.8. And this is just a great workhorse lens. It's wonderful because I can shoot kind of mid-length or close up. And if I get a subject who has a larger nose or a larger chin or a larger forehead, I can shoot closer to 200 and it compresses the features. So that's what I do. When I look at a model, I'll come in and I look, what are her strong features? If her face isn't symmetrical, I won't pose her straight on. Um, if she needs to look taller, I will shoot at a lower angle 
to make her look taller. So when my subjects come in, I just don't start shooting them. I actually analyze what can I do to make them look beautiful and what can I do to tell the story of this brand or this fashion editorial. Um, so the 70 to 200 is really great when I need to compress a face and it helps me get really tight shots. And the other lens that I'll tell you about um, is I shoot a 150 macro when I want those beauty shots that are of the lips or just of the eye. Because it lets you just put just the eye in the entire frame. It's beautiful. Um, so for here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with, let's figure out what we should start with here. I think I'm going to start with the red hair, red lips, white skin. Um, out of all my images, that is what people ask how did you light it? I get that question all the time. It's really simple, and it's called beauty box technique. So I'm going to move this. Oh, do you want to, where do you go? My other assistant, my other lovely assistant. Yeah, will you come up and help me? Thank you. OK, you can just relax for a moment. All right. So when I am looking at a, a shot like this, if I want that red to pop, and I want the light on the face to be even and creamy and smooth, I know that I need pretty even lighting. As soon as I make that lighting dramatic, for me, it starts to pull away from the hair and makeup because I'm paying more attention to the shadows on the face and the dramatic lighting. So I want the color to pop, and that's all that I'm looking for in this image. So the light modifier I'm going to use is that one right there. Do you guys want to turn around for me? Um, I generally use a 18 or 22 inch white beauty dish. And that's what we have here, white beauty dish. And a beauty dish is really great because it gives me defined features. So for example, softbox is soft, right? But if I want to define somebody's jawline and I want to define their cheekbones, I'm going to need a light modifier that gives me more defined shadows. Softbox is too soft for something like that. Now, if you take one of these, you have one of these silver reflectors. This is really, really harsh. And so that usually isn't really good for beauty and portrait photography. So a beauty dish is right in the middle where you get more defined shadows than you would with a softbox, but it's not as harsh as one of these silver reflectors. So that is why probably 80 to 90% of a lot of that commercial fashion you see is lit with a beauty dish. And they're really versatile. If you want them to become more harsh, you add a grid. If you want them to be softer, you add a sock to it. So I'm going to turn these off and move those. And I'm going to have you bring that up to her. So I'm going to turn this off. Excellent. I'm going to have you come up a little bit more towards the edge. Perfect. And that can just move wherever people can see. OK, good. And raise it up for me. Um, put it just there. Good. And point it down at her. Awesome. OK. So when I'm looking here at her, I want the light to be flat. I want it to be frontal for that kind of glowing look that I do. So I'm going to have it centered on her. Perfect. Bring it a little closer to her physically. And I'm going to grab, and this is good. All right, make sure. Yeah. Sure, go for it. Absolutely. This is why I love working with a hairstylist makeup artist. She said, okay, something's not right. I'm going to step in and take care of it. So for me, as a fashion photographer, I can focus on my lighting and posing instead of, is the hair perfect? Is the makeup perfect? All right. If you guys have problems seeing me, let me know if I need to move at all. Let's move just a little bit more. Okay, cool. All right, so... For the sake of this, I'm going to just take a snapshot and make sure it's worth. Oh, yeah. Okay. You, you can just you can just um, move the table a little bit. I actually have an extender that goes more. Okay. Perfect. All right. So I'm just going to test this, and this is why it's bravery. I'm just going to shoot. See what it looks like. All right. Ready, guys? Let's just take a test of the lights and make sure they're all flashing, and make sure that's working beautifully. Let's see. Oh, don't want black and white. OK, so for her, when I shoot a close-up tight shot just like this, look a little more somber, just a little bit. OK. All right, will you double click so that comes up full on the screen? So they can see it. Perfect. OK, so if I go for a shot like this, beauty dish centered, if you're looking at it, it's nice to find features on her cheeks. You can see how her cheekbones come out? 
With a softbox, it would be much less defined. So it defines her cheekbones and it defines her jawline. For me, because of the hair and because of the makeup I have here, this starts to feel a little bit pinup maybe with this lighting, which is fine if you want to do pinup. That's, that's totally fine. But for the creative lighting technique I use, I call it beauty box. So I'm going to have you guys bring your reflectors over here, uh, or the, diffu uh, the white foam core. Um, foam core, these pieces of white foam core are what, like $2.99, $3.99, something like that. Um, I use these for reflectors more than anything um, when I'm in the studio, just to kind of add just a little bit of subtle fill and to control my shadows and highlights. So, all right, so you see the shot right here. Let me take one more. Oh my goodness. Um, can you fix the hair so it comes in on both sides? Perfect. Good. Perfect. Okay. So look straight at me, just like that. Look a little more somber. Okay, good. All right, so you get an idea. This is just with a beauty dish. And now I'm going to have you guys add the foam core. I actually need her to hold one underneath her chin. And what I'm actually doing is I'm going to more or less eliminate shadows. So I put one under the chin that gets rid of the shadows under the chin. And you can actually see it, but you'll see it in the shot. And make a box around her, so put it right on either side of her face. So if you see this beauty box, she is in a box. Um, coming even closer. The closer you bring the fill cards into the face, the more that it eliminates shadows. So if you want there to be a little bit of shadow under the jaw, maybe you back off the reflector a little bit further down. But the difference will be, let's take a look right here. Okay. And yeah, make sure it's working. Pop up. See how it's much more even and much more glowing? And so the effect that I'll do, can you bring the bottom one even closer in? Good, make it nice and tight. Perfect, perfect, let me do one more. Great, right there. And squint your eyes at me just a little bit. I had her squint her eyes at me just a little bit because it makes it look like she's thinking. Versus if you just have kind of your eyes open and they're big and beautiful and doughy, but if she squints them just a little bit, she's thinking about something. So this is going to be that light that I use all the time. Um, how I get the white skin is in Photoshop, I pull out the reds and yellows in her skin and then leave it in the hair. I, there's a whole, I have a couple of techniques on my blog about how to do it, but that is how you get the image that's on my business card. Um, I can show you an example. Right, let's do this. An example of what this looks like um, for a fashion editorial. I've shot it like this, okay? It's the exact same lighting. Beauty dish centered, white fill card to the left, white fill card to the right, one underneath the chin, and then I pull out the reds and yellows in the skin in Photoshop. And I've also, here's another example from the same, um, the same editorial. And it's just really cool. It's creative, it's very, very flat, but it's very, very flattering if you're doing something where you want color to pop. So beauty box lighting. Beautiful, wonderful. I'm going to have you step out real quick while we move that. My light, my settings here, just to give you an idea of uh, the settings I typically work with. Um, I shoot, usually in the studio, ISO 100 um, to ISO 400, something like that. And I usually aim to have my aperture around F11, F9, F11. Um, try to shoot around the sharpest point of the lens. Um, and then it gives me some flexibility in the studio as well. Um, so if I want a highlight in the background pumped up, I have some leverage. Um, I can actually move the lights, power them up here. These are really great, um, these particular Ellen Chrome lights, because they have a lot of power. So if you need to have a lot of light pumped out, um, they're really, really strong. Okay, so that is really easy, really basic um, beauty box lighting. So the next thing that I'm going to do is going to be another form of soft beauty light. Um, how many people have seen Scott teach about, or read on the blog, um, clamshell lighting? Everybody knows clamshell lighting, right? Typically, where, when someone does clamshell lighting, where are the lights? Above and below, right? So it's clamshell because basically, 
the heads of clam, like the pearl in the clam. <laughs> I feel like that's what they call it that. Um, so you have, usually maybe it's a beauty dish above and then a silver reflector below, or maybe it's a softbox above with a silver reflector below. But that's traditional clamshell lighting. You can actually do clamshell lighting with the lights on either side of the subject, and it's really, really beautiful. So I'm going to have you take both of the um, softboxes and put them facing that way, and we'll get rid of this one. That's cool. Maybe just grab the other one. Okay. All right. I know I'm stepping out of light. All right, does this ruin everybody's view? Okay. Okay. All right, perfect. All right, and move them way in together. All right, so when I'm shooting this light setup, what I'm thinking about is I want really light, soft, glowing light. Again, it's kind of flat, so I would not be shooting the black avant-garde piece there. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit. Um, so what I'm going to do is you need two soft boxes of equal size. They have to be equal size and equal power because it creates these really cool catch lights that if you have them be unequal sizes or unequal power, it looks weird. So I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Um, you will take the two even-sized soft boxes. You move them so you're literally shooting through a hole like this big. And what it does, if you look in the catch lights, it's two gigantic catch lights in the eyes, and it makes those eyes sparkle. It just opens them up. It's really beautiful and soft. So, okay, I'm ready. Can I bring you back out? Now let's turn this one on. All right, so to give you an idea, um, I'm actually going to shoot even smaller space than this. Um, all right, so talk about light and placement. All right, so what's wrong with my lights right now? They're too low because right now the bulk of that light is going to light her chest. So I need to raise them up probably a foot and a half. Yeah, right there, that's good. So it's going to put and make them perfectly even, just a little bit lower. Okay, good. So it's going to give her really nice even lighting. I'm going to make it so there's even smaller holes, so close in just a little bit, a uh, little less. Okay, right there. And so can you see it's this much space and tiny. So this is only going to work for me. Um, in this shot, it's going to work for close-ups, for beauty shots. And she's going to have big, beautiful catch lights in her eyes. And I'm just going to shoot it so you have an idea. And let's check what's the uh, aperture, what's the set power settings on the back of this. Three. Three, good. You want them even. Perfect. Can you switch over to Lightroom for me? And make sure I'm not going to pull this off the stage. Perfect. Hi. Okay, great. Here we go. Good. Take a look. And I'm going to zoom in on those catch lights. So if you take a look here, zoom in. it's going to give me these really cool kind of almost cat eye catch lights in the eyes. And so it just gives you really beautiful, glowing frontal light. A lot of times, if I'm photographing somebody with this light, if they have really beautiful makeup on, I will switch over to my 150 macro and come in for a close-up of the eye because the catch lights are interesting. So that's what I'm going to do here for a shot. Let me make sure I don't knock it off. Okay. I'm going to have you lean forward. And the reason I have her lean forward is twofold. First of all, when she leans forward, it puts her eyes closest to the camera. And if this shot is about her eyes, then I want her eyes to look big and beautiful. And the closer that her eyes are to the camera, the bigger they'll look. Just like if somebody's punching towards the camera, the fist looks largest, same thing. So a lot of times I'll have my models lean forward towards the camera for close-ups so it makes the eyes, instead of the nose or the chin or the lips, closest. Um, another reason is it elongates the neck. So a lot of times it just will kind of pull out those tendons in the neck, which is really, really beautiful. So I'm going to have you lean forward. Beautiful. And right there. And let's close down a little bit. Perfect. Okay. And oh, no, I'm going to have to zoom out. It might pop in with the catch lights. So again, here's the catch lights. Let's zoom out. And so it can make kind of a cool kind of pop art feeling image. Or you can get even closer. I'd probably do this if there's really avant-garde makeup. I'm going to have you lean even closer, come way up, like really close. 
Perfect. That's just, just beautiful. And so I'm getting in, so it's just going to be her eye. Okay. Perfect. And so if you're doing beauty photography and you want this kind of really cool catch light, you could just do shots of the eyes. It looks a little dark on the screen. Kind of matches. Um, can we bring down the ambient just a tiny bit? Just a little bit? I'm just looking for ambient down. All right, so that is two light setups. You, and they're both even and flat. One makes different catch lights than the other, but both have this kind of glowing, even light. Works great for beauty photography, um, really great for pinup as well. Oh, that's okay. That's really fine. All right, so the next thing we're going to do, I'm going to give you a break from modeling for a moment. Okay. Yep, you can step out. Are you ready? Okay. All right, next thing. Um, for me as a fashion photographer, it is less important for me when I'm shooting somebody um, that I see their face. A lot of times it's not necessarily about the face. So if you look in a lot of fashion photography, you have kind of the hair across the face all dramatic or it's in shadow. Um, so in this instance, I'm not even going to light her. Can you move this one out of the way? And I'm going to bring you forward. Perfect. I'm going to have you look, step back a little bit, and have you look your head that way and face your body straight on to me. So what I'm going to do in this instance is I'm going to put her in silhouette. And I don't know yet if maybe I'll add a little bit of fill to the foreground, um, if I'm going to add a little bit of contrast that she pops. When you're shooting somebody in silhouette, you need them to have a good silhouette. So in an instance like this where she has just those really, really bold lines and patterns, it's really great. Um, but the reason I'm going to have her in this instance, instead of just facing me, which will just make her head a blob, I'm going to have her head turn to the left or right so that I can see her profile. And so the entire shot will be about the cool arm pieces, the profile of her face, the interesting corset. Um, in order to shoot in silhouette, you light the background and you don't light the subject. Um, However, if you have a really small studio space where all the walls are white, it's really hard to actually get a silhouette because what happens is you light the background and the background reflects off the ceiling, reflects off the floor, reflects off the side walls, and so then it looks kind of just like a muddy picture. Um, your best case scenario is if you can, is you try to pull the subject f as far out from the background as possible and hang up black cloth. If you have black muslin, you can hang from the walls or from the ceiling. That'll allow you to get the silhouette that you're looking for. So I'm going to test this out on you. And I'm going to show you kind of my, my thought process as I'm doing this. If I'm going to have her pose a little bit differently, if I'll have her lean, if I'll change the lighting. Um, so I'm going to shoot this. And in this instance, since I'm doing kind of a mid-length shot, I'm going to switch to my 24 to 70. So it'll allow me to zoom um, and get that same... Uh, get kind of a crop to maybe the knees. Um, for me, she, she has really, she's really tall, really long legs. So if I want to accent that and shoot a full length shot, I said before, you want to get to a low angle if you want somebody to look taller. But what tends to happen is that people shoot from a low angle like here, okay? If you shoot from a low angle here, you get the shot up the nose. And so that's usually what it does. It kind of makes the thighs look really large. It's a shot up the nose. But if you look at a lot of fashion magazines, you can actually tell that many times the photographers have their cameras almost on the ground. Can you ever tell that where you see how low of an angle it is? So what they're doing is they're actually just backing up really far, getting on the ground, and using a long lens. It's not up the nose anymore, and it's not accenting a particular part of the body, like the thighs. Instead, it's just making her look really tall and slender. So I'll probably try a shot like that as well. But for now, let's take a look. Okay, make sure. Perfect. All right, I'm going to have you tuck your arms behind your back as much as possible so they basically disappear. Um, yeah, just like that. So what I did, can you turn so they can see that? So I had her put her arms behind her back. In a portrait, if somebody puts their arms behind their back, it's kind of, kind of weird. <laughs> Looks like they have no arms. But in fashion, all the rules that go out the, the window. You can do whatever you want. So for me, I have her put her arms behind her back because it gives me a nice, clean line. And that's what I want. I want it to be about 
the beautiful shoulder piece instead of kind of the arms that are hanging out in the back. So face me straight on, perfect, just like that, and turn your head that way. Perfect, let's give this a try. And I already know in this instance that I would be shooting in black and white, so you can set that in a preset if you so wanted. Um, so this is what it looks like kind of straight off the camera already. Um, a couple things that I'd look for are, right, you see the lens flare in the bottom left? I can keep it if I want, if that's what I wanted for my image, but I would probably get rid of it and see in the top right how it's a little dark. That means that both of those lights are pointed down, and so I need one hitting the top of the background more. So can one of you point the light more towards the top of the, the sweep? Yeah, that's great. That'll be perfect. Um, a couple things that I'm analyzing as I'm looking over here, um, I will probably pull back this hair so that it's nice, clean line. So if, can we can pull the hair back a little bit? Perfect. Yes. Um, yeah, pump it up and point it up. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, another thing that I'm seeing here when I look at a shot like this is I feel like my eye is getting trapped right here. Does anyone else have that same feeling? My eye kind of just gets trapped in that negative space. So what I'll probably have her do, I'm going to have you cross your legs, one in front of the other, yep. And I'll do this all the time. I'll have my models cross their legs so that it's making a line down. So if I end at the knees, I'm actually tapering out of the frame. So it's a really nice entry point and exit point for a fashion image if you're not including the feet. If you are including the feet, you know, I try to do a lot of movement and jumping. But here, that will be fine. OK. All right, perfect. Let me take a look at the hair. Good, so I have nice clean images there. Okay, and I'll have you tuck your arms behind the back. Perfect, and head to the, your left a little more. Good, perfect. Okay, great. So if you compare the two images for the changes there, it just gets a lot cleaner and a lot more graphic. I'd probably have her lift her chin up just a little bit more, um, but you can shoot in silhouette if the image is about shooting in silhouette, if that's what it's all about. Um, I can, if I decide, all right, you know what? I think her makeup looks really cool. I'd really like to see some of her face. So I can throw my beauty dish in, and so I'm going to have you guys do that. But for a shot like this, you can treat it two ways. If you put the beauty dish centered, it's not as dramatic, but that might be what you want. Maybe it's illuminating the model, and you're just kind of trying to catch the beautiful light on her face, and it's all about the drama of the clothing. Or one of the rules is if the light is in the center, kind of even with the model, that's even flat beauty light. The more dramatic you want it, the further you take that light to the left or to the right, because it makes more shadows. Um, another thing that people forget, people usually think, OK, dramatic light, if I'm, this, if I'm the model, you might move the light to the left or to the right. But people forget that if you raise the light up, that makes it more dramatic as well. Because what it does is it casts the shadows down on the cheeks and on the jawline, and it makes that more dramatic. So when I just raise that way up, like really, really high up, as high as that probably goes. OK, no, that's good. Perfect, just like that. And a good model knows that if you are posing this model, and the light is over on this side, if she turns her head to the right, now it's lighting the side of her face, and it's lighting her neck instead of her face. So what I tell my model, because they don't necessarily know, is I'll say, play to this light. This is your light. I'll tell them, because otherwise, they might be posing and moving, and they're looking the wrong direction. And so all of those shots where they were looking long, wrong direction, I can't use. So I'll tell them, OK, feel free to move your body however you want, but keep your head in that direction. And so that's how I get it so I have more usable shots, usable images. OK, feel free. I'm going to grab same thing. I'm going to show you the shooting at the two different angles so you can see um, shooting from kind of standing level and then again shooting on the ground. OK, perfect. Thank you. All right, perfect. OK, just like that, cross your legs again. One more time. Perfect. Take a look. Oh, hold on. Let me open up a little bit more. Right there. OK. All right, so for this image, I can make it really, really high contrast black and white. 
which is what I probably do. But what problem do we run into when you light it like this? What's the problem? Anybody? It gets all washed out. What happens is if you overlight the background, it creates lens flare that kind of bounces around the image, and then you lose that high contrast feel. So what you need to do is either pull the subject further out from the background, or you turn down your background lights. So can I have you guys turn down the background lights to half of that? OK, perfect. Actually, even a third of that. So you pick a number. And I will do the same thing. And I'm going to show you the different heights now. So put it at like 2L. If it goes 2.3. 2.3 is fine. Perfect. Um, yeah, just a little bit. Pump that up for me a little bit. OK, sounds good. All right, so he's just turning that light up a little bit. So what I'm doing here is I'm balancing it out. In that shot, how I shot the silhouette, the background's too bright now. So what I need to do is turn down the background and turn up my main light. So same thing, beautiful, just like that. Arms tucked a little more. Take a look. OK, perfect. And I'll show you the two different angles. Ready? Shooting wide from up close. Let's do kind of here doesn't work versus if I come back here and shoot at a low angle she just looks incredibly tall so let me show you the difference and of course ignore the background because we don't have the, the psych wall here see how here she looks tall and beautiful and slender and it makes her look really really powerful in the frame Versus in this shot, it just kind of emphasizes her midsection and you're shooting up her nose. So you can shoot at a, a really low angle to make someone look tall, but you have to back up and use a longer lens. So in this shot, in order to get it so that I'm shooting up at her, I was shooting kind of at 24. Usually you don't want to do portraits at 24 close up. When I backed up and I shot more at 70, it really, really makes her look tall and slender. So the next thing that I'm going to do, I can have you step off, is I am going to bring back lens flare on purpose this time. Um, and this is how I do images where I have lens flare on purpose, like something like this. Okay. Um, a lot of times you're not meant to have lens flare because it decreases contrast and it can be a distracting highlight. But I do a lot of editorials where I have lens flare on purpose actually in the studio. So, um, it's r uh, roughly. OK, um, are you good? Can I bring you out? All right, so pump up the background lights again. Perfect. And what are you putting it up to? All right, we'll put the background lights up to five. So in this instance, I'm going to have my background set at five. And I'm going to need the I'm going to need one of these heads. Can you take the softbox off of that? Okay, perfect. All right, great. I'm going to have you stand right here. Actually, I'm changing my mind. Let's do this. I'm going to take both of these. Okay, I'm going to have you put both of the soft boxes in the front and put that one in the back with no head on. Okay, so my ideas for here, how it'll work, is I want see this light, how it's kind of frontal and even. I'm going to use the same two soft boxes in the front, light on the back, and then another light over her shoulder, literally a light pointing back at the camera to create lens flare. So oh, it's cool. It's totally fine. I can take those off easily. So take those and put that back in the front for the kind of frontal even light. Got it. Oh, that's attached. Shh. Hold on. Technical difficulty. Got it? Got it. Cool? No, unscrew that. Unscrew Keep, that. Going? Keep going? Keep going. Okay. Keep going. Apparently, this attaches into the light. Cool? Thank you. It's this part that we need. Thank you. Do you guys have any questions so far? Can I take a question? Am I allowed to do that? Yes. Okay. Um, so here's what I'm going to tell you, and I'll tell you kind of two parts. Um, in this instance, when I have a, a white background, I'm lighting it about two stops over 
my subject. It's about two stops over. But if I want lens flare, it's closer to three. So I pump it up because I'm actually going to have it hit the background and wrap around the subject. Um, same thing, it's in that two, three stop range over when I'm silhouetting the subject. Um, a lot of times what I'll do is I will take a meter and meter it, or it's whatever looks good. Um, and I don't mean that to say you shouldn't know exposure. I don't mean that to say you shouldn't know how to use a light meter. But a lot of people let that get in the way. If you have lens flare and you're like, oh, wow, that looks great, then that can be a really strong image. All right. yeah, did, did, yeah, I wanted that off. Is that not what he did? It went back on. Um, can I borrow you to take that, the beauty dish off? OK. So let me light this evenly again from the front. Perfect. How you doing? I'm good. OK, perfect. All right, so I'm going to light it evenly from the front. Oh, and I have this. I don't know what this belongs to. I stole that. All right, let me switch over to, actually, I can shoot with this 24 to 70. All right, beautiful. Let me take a test here. Don't, um, don't look at the light. <laughs> I'm going to blind you. OK. OK, good. Perfect. And it's going to actually go behind her shoulder. So I have the background light, so it's pure white. Two lights in the front, so it's super even. See how you're getting a little bit of lens flare? It's starting to wrap around. So I'm actually going to put a light. Can you point it back towards her, right back towards me? And so what I look for is I actually want to see that light in the frame. And I have it kind of peeking out of a shoulder or out from around her neck. And so what is that set on? What do you have right now? OK, good. So I'm going to test this. And perfect. I'm going to have you lean that way just a little bit. So I'm making it so that her body is going to partially block the light. I have two lights in the front that are even, the two lights on the back, which are overpowering the background. Instead of two stops over, they're closer to three. I'm switching to kind of a beauty portrait lens, my 70 to 200. Um, stand really still and put one hand up to your face. Perfect, just like that. And there is no way to meter this because you're actually doing exactly what you're not supposed to do. You're, exact, you're overexposing, you're adding lens flare. And so it gives you kind of that, the person's on the stage, or it's going to be something for um, an album cover. So I have a light over her, back behind her. That light is generally powered similar to what I have the lights in the front. It, there's no right answer. It's whatever looks good. So what I try to do is I try to angle it so that lens flare you see in her hair, I just need to angle it so it's not on her hair, but it can still be there. So I can shoot over your shoulder just like this a little. Perfect. Good. OK. So it's going to give me a really soft, diffused light. And I'll probably tell you straight off the bat, when you do lens flare in the studio, it decreases contrast. It, it, you're going to have a muddy image. That's what lens flare is. So in order to remedy that, if you're using something like Lightroom 4, what I'll typically do is I will drag the black points in order to give a black point to that image, or I'll increase the clarity. So for example, let's see, add a little bit of black point, a little bit of clarity, pull down vibrance a little bit, and I'll probably do kind of something like that as my image. So it's really light and airy, and I use it all the time for fashion editorials and for when I photograph singers, um, for album covers, if I want that feel to the image. So I'm going to shoot one more of those a little bit further length, uh, further down, and show you a couple posing techniques. All right, I'm going to have you face me straight, straight forward with your hands at your side. Perfect. And take a little bit of step that way. Good. OK. When you're photographing a model or any portrait subject, they're going to be widest when they're facing straight on. Um, if you want to face someone straight on, for example, if they're wearing a really cool avant-garde piece like that, you have them face straight on, and you have them give a little bit of space between their body and their arms. Because if I have my hands straight at my sides, you can't actually tell where my body ends and begins. So I can be two inches wider on either side when my hands are tight against my body. So even just giving a little tiny bit of negative space helps emphasize the form. 
So if I do want to have her face straight on, um, put your hands down just a little bit. Good. And actually, put, do one with your hands straight at your side so they can see. Straight. Good. And do one with a little bit of space. And do it so it's kind of a little bit more on your leg. Good. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. And I will have to Photoshop out the cord. It's just there. It's totally fine. All right, so if you see that, it looks kind of flat. Versus if I give a little bit of space in the arms, I didn't even really have her do much besides just give a little bit of shape there. Gives her a little bit more. Um, instead of having somebody face straight on, which typically is not flattering, what you usually have somebody do is turn three quarters to the left or right. You pick one. Three quarters to the left or right. And you put the weight on their back leg. The reason you do that is if you have somebody kind of stick their hip out towards the camera. Like I said before with the eyes, whatever is closest to the camera is biggest. So if you put somebody's hip towards the camera, now their hip looks really wide. Um, I Sometimes, depending on if who I'm photographing, they want that. And they'll turn around backwards and put their hip towards the camera. Depends on the person. Um, but typically what you want is for them to put the weight on the back leg because that pulls the waist away from the camera, which makes them look much more slender. And then it puts the eyes closer to the camera and the chest closer to the camera. So I'm going to have you turn kind of three quarters. Good. Give me a little space with the arms and lean towards sort of the camera just a little bit. Um, when I have people posing with their hands on their body, I never do kind of hard angles, anything like that. I have them set their hand there, just set it carefully. Um, another thing as well, if somebody just their hand looks awkward, I'll have them just kind of rub their hand up against the body a few times and then just kind of stop them in between. Because if you say put your hand on your hip, it, they usually put a lot of pressure there. Their hands get kind of tense. It's right angles. Versus if you just kind of rub your hand along the body and you stop, you don't have that same pressure. It looks really elegant. You see that nice curve at the side of the hand. And it's the same thing. If somebody, you have them looking like they have their hand in their hair. When you pose people like this, a lot of times it looks really forced versus if you just have somebody move and keep moving their hand through their hair. So it, you're better off if you want someone to look like they're jumping, actually have them jump. So I'll do one more shot just like that. And instead, put your hand just real soft on the side. Good. And that hand, wiggle your fingers. Wiggle your fingers. Perfect. All right, perfect. Beautiful. Okay, great. When I am shooting, I will tell you that I shoot a lot. That's just how I like to shoot. I will direct somebody, and I'm just trying to pull different emotion out of the individual. So I direct them. I'll tell them if they're supposed to feel sexy or if it's supposed to be stoic and serious. And so I'll give them that kind of direction. Um, typically for something like this, I'll have that light on a boom so that I don't have the, uh, the stand in the background. But it just gives you kind of movie, glamour, beautiful lighting. So let me put one more thing up for you guys. If you want this presentation, again, you can check it out on my blog, which is blog.lindsayalderphotography.com. I did a Kelby training um, on fashion flair for portrait and wedding photography. So I've written two books, and the second topic was how to add fashion techniques to your portrait and wedding photography. If you're looking at something like this, yes, she's a model with really cool red hair. Okay. Um, yes, that she is beautiful. Yes, that you know this is going to actually be her profession. But I regularly use these techniques for brides. Can you imagine this? If you have a bride all in white with a beautiful white dress, and you have that lens flare wrapping around her, she's holding her flowers. So even if you don't shoot models, you can use creative studio lighting in anything you do, so that you stand out, so that your images aren't the same lighting techniques that you see over and over again. It helps you stand out from the crowd, and it gives you something to differentiate yourself. When people are looking at all of these photographers that shoot the same lighting, it's really hard for them to be able to pick somebody who's different. So you can use that in your lighting and your styling, and my last tip is use it in your personality. Um, when somebody calls you up, when you meet with somebody, it's not the photography that's generally selling them, it's you as an individual. Connecting with them and letting them know that you want to help them get the best image of themselves that you can. So thank you for coming and enjoy the rest of your conference. <laughs>